We're here with Perry Halkidis, um, a dean, I believe, at Rutgers University, uh, and recent program manager of the HIV caucus, as well as a member of the, I'm sorry, HIV section, as well as a member of the LGBT caucus. Perry, tell us a bit about your work here with APHA and the section and the caucus. So my, my own research has focused on the health of gay men for some 25 years mm -hmm. um, with a primary interest in HIV, but not exclusively in HIV. Mm -hmm. So my work with the American Public Health Association is really trying to advance the well-being of sexual and gender minority people as a member of the caucus mm -hmm. based on the research that I do. Mm -hmm. But also um, the last two years helping the HIV section do programming that is relevant and captures where we are with the epidemic in 2018 and 2019. Mm. And what is that relevant programming? Can you tell us a bit more about it? Sure. Um, the program, and uh, in, in the HIV program in the last two years has really focused a lot on the development of biomedical advances. Mm -hmm. Biomedical advances have provided us both prevention approaches and treatment approaches. Mm -hmm. And there are thoughts that we can eradicate HIV um, in the next five or 10 years by harnessing the power of those approaches. Now, mm -hmm. of course, the challenge is with any medication, people have to take it. And mm -hmm. so from a public health perspective, we're thinking about how people access medication, how do they stay on their medications, how do they pay for their medications, mm -hmm. so that we can bring an end to AIDS with these with these tools that we have. I see. Very interesting. And so how does the section, what is the distinction between a section and a caucus and what is the focus of a section versus a caucus? Yeah, and I'm not really 100% sure of that, but yeah. I think like it's almost like a state and a territory, I think okay. is my okay. best, you know, sort of metaphor for that. Like mm -hmm. the, the, the sections are these groups that are sanctioned by APHA. Mm -hmm. the, ta the caucuses are these groups that are self-formed and self-perpetuating. But I imagine, I'm, I'm not 100% sure of this, that if, if a caucus gets momentum and grows, mm -hmm. it may one day be a section. Mm -hmm. I see. How many members of the section uh, for HIV are there and how many members for the LGBT group? Yeah, so, you know, um, thousands of members of it for the HIV group, um, maybe hundreds of members of LGBT, uh, okay. but both growing groups. I mean, the LGBT caucus is right there and I'm looking at them right now. Um, you know, LGBTQ public health issues are incredibly important. Um, they sort of get swept aside oftentimes. It's one of the reasons that uh, in the last year I founded a new journal focused on LGBTQ public health because the way we think about the population is uh, critical and also thinking about the different parts of the LGBTQ population and mm -hmm. sort of deciphering the needs of lesbians versus gay men versus trans folks is crucially important. Oh, that's interesting. So uh, talk a bit more about those, you know, sort of subgroups within the LGBT community yeah. and, uh, and, and what some of the public health needs are. So we know that generally LGBTQ people face heightened health disparities and heightened health issues. but. What diff but it would be a mistake to treat the population as monolithic. Mm -hmm. So trans men and trans women, gay men, lesbians, bisexual folks face different challenges. For, mm -hmm. for, for gay men for a very long time, it was a lot about HIV. Um, but it's not that anymore. It's about HPV. It's about violence. Mm -hmm. um, for lesbians, it's about smoking and obesity. Mm -hmm. For trans folks, it's about violence against their, 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 their gender and about the effects of hormone therapy mm -hmm. and the effects of laws that prevent them from um, functioning in our, in our military or accessing services that are appropriate. What cuts across all of the groups is, you know, a healthcare system that's ill-prepared to take care of LGBTQ people, with one in five LGBTQ people saying they avoid the doctor because they fear discrimination, mm -hmm. uh, with a lack of cultural competence on the part of healthcare providers. And here's where public health has to play a very big role in educating both mm -hmm. healthcare and policymakers about the needs of the population. Mm -hmm. And the HIV section, uh, when was that founded? Uh, shortly after the onset of AIDS, mm -hmm. um, so you, you know, in the in the late in the mid to late 1980s, mm -hmm. and you say there are thousands of members uh, to that. So, talk to me a bit about what the section is doing. In so, I mean, you know, HIV is like not the epidemic that it was 37 years ago, but you know, as the epidemic has evolved, so has our thinking. Mm -hmm. So, this notion 
that people's behavior in and of itself is enough to bring an end to AIDS is short-sighted. Mm -hmm. In fact, we need to focus on laws and policies that make people engage in risk behaviors. Mm -hmm. And if you change those laws and policies and make people feel less marginalized because they're, weak, because they're female or because they're black or because they're gay, mm -hmm. you're going to create less minority stressors in their lives. When you create less minority stressors in their lives, mm -hmm. there's less risk behavior. Where there's less risk behavior, there's less HIV transmission. So nesting HIV within this larger framework of a biopsychosocial, social structural, socio-ecological perspective is a lot of what the caucus has been doing in the last few years. Also thinking about how to harness technologies like, mm -hmm. you know, electronic technologies and medical technologies to bring them into the end of the epidemic um, mm -hmm. has been really an important part of the, of the work we've been doing also. Interesting, interesting. So um, as program leader, what were your activities? What were your daily focus? So at the, as the program manager for the uh, conference program the last two years, my, my colleague and I, Rob Stevenson and I, who we were the co-managers, you know, we had to organize the topic, the topic areas for the conference. Mm -hmm. We had to solicit papers for submission. We had to solicit mm -hmm. reviewers. We had to manage the reviews. Once the reviews are in, we had to help select the, re uh, the, 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 the papers and then organize them thematically. So a lot of work in like sort of like organization and management to make sure you put together a program that what makes sense, mm -hmm. is relevant, is mm -hmm. timely, and is just quite frankly interesting. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, why come to the conference? Mm -hmm. Interesting. So you're at Rutgers. Are you from New Jersey originally? I'm a, I'm a New York City born and bred. Okay. Um, Rutgers is not that far from New York City. I mm -hmm. grew up in New York, the child of Greek immigrant parents. I was at NYU for 20 years and I've been mm -hmm. at Rutgers for the last two years. But I, you know, I, I live in New Jersey, but I also still have a place in New York City. So you stayed close to home. I don't ever like to veer far away from home. I see. Okay. Very good. Uh, except for uh, the occasional trip to Washington, maybe. The occasional trip to Washington or Europe or some p amazing part of the world like China or you know Taiwan, which I was just at. I see. Great. Good. So, um, what is uh, look down uh, look down your uh, crystal ball and tell me where will the LGBT caucus be in ten years and where will the HIV section be? It's a really good question. So. I think this is a really important moment for both of those groups, and probably more so for the LGBT group. But, you know, in the United States, over the course of the last few years under the federal administration, LGBTQ people have been under attack. Um, you know, the Supreme Court has, hit, has just heard a case about firing of LGBTQ people based on their sexual and gender identities. Hopefully it'll come back favorably. But I think um, given the various sociopolitical factors that are at play, Mm -hmm. It's a call to arms for the LGBTQ caucus, so I just think it's going to grow. Um, and, it's go and it's going to morph into this group that is much more sophisticated. I think it does it now, but it'll do it even in a more sophisticated way, realizing how sexual and gender identity and race and culture and all of those factors interact to define mm -hmm. the population. Because mm -hmm. it's not just about being a gay person or a lesbian person or a trans person or a mm -hmm. bi person. Mm -hmm. So that's one. HIV, I think HIV, we're always looking for a cure, right? And so, I mean, I always say to my, my friends and my colleagues, but I'd be fine if there was a cure tomorrow. I could find other things to research. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that we are going to continue to try to figure out how we harness current medical advances to bring an end to the epidemic, mm -hmm. try to figure out how we uh, enact policies and laws that don't discriminate positive people mm -hmm. and give them access to health care, mm -hmm. um, and try to like cut the huge disparity that exists right now in the United States, which is like if you're poor and black and gay, you're so much more likely to require HIV than if you're not any of those things. And so attacking structural racism, structural homophobia, and AIDS phobia, I think is going to be a big, it will, needs to be a big part of the section's work. Now, early on in the interview, you mentioned prevention uh, plus management. So prevention of acquiring HIV, but also right. the, the management techniques if you have HIV. Can you talk about some of those advancements? Sure. So the biomedical advances offer us two opportunities. Number one, um, for HIV positive people, um, treatment provides a lot provides them an opportunity to have a normal life expectancy. But it also has another prevention benefit, which is that HIV positive people who are on medications who 
take their medications and have their virus suppressed, cannot infect others. Mm -hmm. This is a model called undetectable equals untransmittable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Something that the Swiss knew in 2008, but we just figured out in 2016. And my mm -hmm. colleague, Bruce Rickman, who runs the Prevention Access Campaign, and I and others put together a statement a few years ago. And now it's pretty much accepted as a widely held belief that mm -hmm. positive people who are suppressed cannot transmit. So it's a personal good and, and, it's, an outro, and it's a prevention good. Mm -hmm. But we also know that if you use well, at least there's there's two medications currently approved that if you take them every day and you're a negative person, act like kind of like a birth control pill mm -hmm. and prevent you from acquiring HIV. And that's called pre-exposure prophylaxis. Mm -hmm. um, and that's taking medication every single day means that even in the absence of a condom, if you're exposed to HIV, you will not acquire HIV. So that's how biomedical events have and shifted does the epidemic. does that medication have any side effects? Very limited side effects. I mean, every medication has some side effects, but in terms of a cost-benefit analysis, the side effects um, are minimal compared to the benefits it bestows. I see. Very interesting. Um, you mentioned the cure. Yeah. Is there going to be one? I hope so. Uh, I think it's possible. I think immune therapies provide an avenue uh, for that. I think um, we've made advances in that regard. I mean, there have been a couple of cases that have, have devolved over the last few years where people have been somewhat eradicated of the disease. Um, right now, it's just a chronic disease, but a cure, yeah, I, I can see a cure in like 15, 20 years time. Maybe even a vaccine, although the, the last vaccine trial would, did not go so well. Very interesting. Anything else you'd like to add? Yeah, I mean, I, I, what I would like to just say is that, you know, I think what is amazing about this organization and what public health people do is that they work hand in hand with medical providers and nurses and other health care providers and really thinking about not just the health of individuals, but the health of populations. Mm, very interesting. Good. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Interesting session. I appreciate it. All